Hello and welcome to Lexitecture, a podcast about word origins and histories. My name is Ryan, and in each episode my friend Amy and I bring a new pair of words to share their stories with each other and you. You can find our past episodes and the occasional blog post on our website at lexitecture.com, follow along with us on Twitter and Facebook at Lexitecture, and if you really like what we do, you can support the show at patreon.com slash lexitecture. Today's episode, Flirt Graph. Yes, let us word. We should get on. Uh, we have two new Patreon Oh, wow. Awesome. To thank. Um, so one is uh, Allison, who is our friend in cheese. One who hopefully, Allison. Uh, Allison. Yeah. I, two, of my, two of my closest friends, best humans in the whole world, <laughs> are called Allison, which occasionally leads to some small confusion. But um, yeah, Allison's are good guys, for sure. Good stuff. And I'm just going to apologize right now because... I am going to get this name wrong. Oh, I am. Maybe not. It is not. Maybe not. Well, so the spelling is K-H-O-I-N-G-U-Y-E-N. I believe Vietnamese. And I believe the way to do it is Hoi Nguyen. Wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Hoi Nguyen. Nguyen. I think that's what it is. Nguyen. Which I, I believe, which I believe is one of and the I apologize most... For that. <laughs> I believe it's one of the most common surnames in the world. Which is not in any way yeah. to, to diminish um, to diminish your your specialness, uh, but I, I it's interesting to me <laughs> yeah. that you know it's it's interesting that you or I would go oh that's a complicated name to say when actually there are yeah. quite a lot of people in the world who are like ah. <laughs> it is it is the equivalent yeah it's it's the Smith or Jones yeah but uh, yeah my my, my entirely western white face can't produce that sound as eloquently as i should be able to but do not think do not mistake my mispronunciation for a lack of gratitude this thank Likewise. you for signing up as a patreon sponsor yeah. um patreon.com slash lexitecture for anyone who was like oh patreon that sounds interesting we uh, and we, it is we we love you guys it's it's it continues to be just entirely wonderful that you feel like you would like to reach in your pockets and support what we do it's uh yeah it's great thank you so much it's great now you have had a word burning a hole in your pocket for some time now oh my goodness it's the lost word (laughs) (laughs) so dear listener if you recall last episode i was quite angry because we were a word (laughs) done and that was because i had painstakingly uh compiled my notes on the word that I was going to talk about into uh, Apple Notes on my phone and then I literally walked from one room to the next, turned on my computer, went to access the note through here and it was gone. It was completely gone. It has never happened to me before or since with with Apple Notes. Um, I tried all the things to try and recover it and it had just disappeared leaving me with the choice to A, wing it. Now, you're probably aware that I'm quite a proficient winger, but I, I'd spent <laughs> so much time and effort on looking up this word and, and I, I found it really interesting and I thought it was a good one. So I didn't want to just half-ass it. So that's why we made the decision last time to, to have just one word. So this time, no, oh God, now I feel like I've hyped it up. What if it's shit? <laughs> I'm so excited. There's no pressure, but I'm so excited. No, no pressure. And you're gonna let everyone down if it sucks. Whew, yeah. Oh, right. Okay. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna get right in there. In that case, I'm going first, yeah, whether you like it or not. Absolutely. Uh, the, the word that I'm going to talk about today is graph. G R A P H. And the the inspiration, if you will, for for me looking at this word, was a really really cool article that I read. It was in the New Yorker, the June twenty first uh, edition by Hannah Fry, and it's called When Graphs Are a Matter of Life and Death. If you happen to follow The New Yorker on social media, it's it's actually, it's one of these that that they've kind of shared and tweeted and put on Instagram several times. It's a really, really cool article, and I'm not going to talk about it in in a whole lot of detail because you should go and read it. Um, But essentially it alerted me to the fact that graphs didn't always exist. Hmm. Which sounds crazy because, of course, graphs didn't always exist. But but <laughs> right. then again, who invented the graph? That 
You know, oh, that's, that's the sort question. of question that, that I find really very interesting. And what I discovered in Hannah Fry's wonderful article was that you can answer that question actually quite, quite definitively. Oh, a graph cool. is, of course, a visual representation of data of some sort of numerical value. And I don't know about you, but I love a graph because yeah. I'm not particularly good at visualizing numbers. You know, like if, if someone yeah. says to me 10 billion things, my brain just silently explodes and none of that information is taken in beyond the fact that 10 billion is a lot. Like if you were to ask me to compare 10 billion things to 50 billion things, even the fact that I know 10 and 50, I, I can't work with that because those numbers are just too big to fit into my head. Yeah, they don't work. There's a there's a cool little website that I once, um, I used it once for a teaching something or other. Um, I forget the, the exact, I'll, I'll look it up, but basically it, it gives you a graphical representation of what a million things looks like. Oh, it's just, cool. it's it's a little, it's, it's just a single web page and they're little stick figures and you scroll down and you scroll along for the you know the size that this website has to be in order to allow you to to visualize a million things but it's yeah it's it's very cool and there are various ways to sort the data in terms of things like population and gender and you know, all all that sort of stuff so it's it, that that's pretty cool but but i really struggle to visualize numbers so turns out that this this is a thing that that you know in 1628 was recognised by Michael Florent van Langren. Now, he is believed to be the first visual representer of data. And what, what he did was he drew a diagram that showed, it showed a, how much variance there was between the estimates of the longitude between the city of Toledo in Spain and Rome, which of course was, you know, the centre of the, the Holy Roman Empire, if you will. Um, yeah. So people people were guessing at that point. Um, this is where Toledo is, and this is where Rome is. And if you want to know the longitude between them, here's my best guess. Because of course, best guesses yeah. that that's how cartography went in those days until it became more of an exact science. And what he was pointing out was that it was fine to guess, but that some of the guesses that had been made were actually pretty wild. And so he, he drew a he drew a little diagram that's pictured, by the way, in this in this article in the New Yorker. Um, he drew a little diagram to show that if you were to follow all these different estimates, you'd find yourself in a lot of different places, some of them quite far away from Rome. And this is kind of believed to be the first graph, if you like. So hmm. having read that, having read that graphs had been invented um, and by whom and when, um, I, I got looking at, at the rest of the, the kind of history of the word, the, the usage of the word. Now, there's an interesting little, um, I suppose you could call it a blip on the graph. The, <laughs> the first visual representation of data is from 1628. Now, when okay. I looked up the word graph, what I discovered is that it's actually an abbreviation. And it's an oh. abbreviation of the word graphic. Yeah, and the... Um, the sort of diagram sense is much younger than, than the, the sense of, of graphic. Now, Etym Online states that the word graphically, meaning vividly, is from the 1570s. That's in Etym Online, a resource which we use a lot and which, I, in fact, I support on Patreon because it's such a fantastic site and it's such an amazing resource for me, yeah. for this podcast, for all kinds of things. You know, it, it's really, really brilliant. But I wasn't able to find any more evidence for that particular uh, claim that graphically vividly is from 1570s. Um, right. I, yeah, I, I wasn't really sure where else to look at. I, I couldn't find it in any of my kind of obvious places and I couldn't find it in any of the slightly less obvious places that I looked at. But Etym Online has this citation to say that the sense of the word vividly is from the 15, 1570s and was being used in the 1570s. For for me personally, looking at the, the kind of usual sources that, that I would look at, the OED, um, other kind of historical usage things, uh, what I found was that the, the first usage of the word graphic is from 1637. And 
it's actually an obsolete sense, which uh, I find quite interesting. It's often the case when you look up these words. But originally, in its very first sense, or certainly the very first sense that we have written down, it meant something that was drawn with a pencil or a pen. Oh, okay. Now, that's not, it's not so far away from meanings that, that we would use nowadays that, that you would consider a completely obsolete usage. But I suppose, yeah. you know, we wouldn't look at a, a cartoon, for example, a hand-drawn doodle, and say that it was a graphic. But nonetheless, people didn't say it in 1637. And then in 1669, we get this sense that Etym Online hints at, the, the definition given is, producing by words the effect of a picture, vividly descriptive or lifelike. Oh, A graphic description of something. It is right. interesting, isn't it? It's quite, quite a lovely definition. So being able to describe something that kind of puts a picture into the listener's head. And this presumably gives us the term agraphia, which, as you recall, blew our minds a little while ago when we first heard about this. <laughs> agraphia is an inability to picture things in your head. Yeah. And some people can't do that. Yeah. Yeah. Richard Herring, the, the comedian and writer, is a, a notable example. Uh, he, he often is mentioned on Twitter and things like this. But uh, yeah. I, I find it particularly baffling to think that a writer can't visualise things in their head because that seems to me to be yeah. crucial, quintessential to the process of writing. But, but I suppose not. It, it works for him. Interestingly, a lot of the chat about agraphia that I've seen, particularly referring to Richard Herring, involves people being doubtful that it is a thing, which... It's, it's kind of like telling people right. what to do with, with their bodies when it's none of your damn business. Somebody telling me what's happening inside my own head, yeah, they can fuck all the way off. <laughs> anyway, so, so this was in 1669. We then get a sense that's, that's very, very much uh, still used, still incredibly pervasive, and perhaps what you would first think of when you hear the word graphic. Around about 1756, the word graphic begins to mean of or relating to drawing or painting, as in the graphic arts. So the fine arts of drawing, painting, engraving, etching, etc. Also the techniques of production and design involved in printing and publishing. So 1756 is where this, this kind of comes in. But there's more. 1778, Ooh. graphic then takes on the sense of or pertaining to writing and fit to be written on. Another interesting oh, little see. shade yeah. within the, the kind of story of this word. Huh. Then in 1786, shortly after that sense, we, we come to a man, a Scotsman, who might perhaps, uh, with no disrespect whatsoever to Michael Florent van Langren, he might be seen to be the, the father of what we know nowadays uh, as the graph. He published a book in 1786 called The Commercial and Political Atlas. And this book was all about visualisations of data. He represented yeah. things like um, the budget outlay of the Royal Navy Jeez. for the last hundred years. This book and William Playfair's later works led us to um, a line graph of a time series. He also created the bar chart and the pie chart. Without William Playfair, we wouldn't be um, we wouldn't be experiencing the pandemic in quite such interesting um, graphical ways. <laughs> right. And of course, you know, the, the, I, I keep saying my husband is a maths teacher and our kind of inside joke is 2020 it was a great year for maths. Because suddenly everybody and their grandfather got to know what uh, exponentials were. Yeah. And sadly, that is a situation that hasn't gone anywhere. And, you know, consulting graphs has become much more of a part of my life than it was pre-pandemic. That's true. But the story goes on. We're still on graphic. We'll, we'll get to, to graph itself. That, that comes a little bit later in the story. But um, in 1814, we have the sense graphic, meaning of a mineral. This is quite a beautiful definition. I like this. I didn't know this one beforehand. A mineral which presents on the surface or in the fracture an appearance of written or printed characters. So you might find oh. graphic gold or graphic ore or graphic tellurium, which is also known as sylvanite, a little interesting uh, offshoot. Graphic tellurium yeah. is called sylvanite. And I thought, oh, I wonder what that has to do with this. Sylvan means woods. And yeah. I wonder if it's 
perhaps to do with the composition of the mineral, is it fossilised tree material? It's actually called sylvanite because it can be found in Transylvania. That's, of all of the mundane explanations, that's the coolest yeah, one. I was, uh, I was exactly the same. It was like, oh, 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 those were the noises, yes. Yeah. Sometimes etymology turns you into a gorilla and there's nothing you can do about it. <laughs> then, in 1847, the story of the, the graphical representation, the, the graph as we know it, uh, took on a really, really interesting uh, facet. This is discussed in Hannah Fry's article, and it's one of these things that I immediately wanted to find out more about. A man named Charles Ebry, a Frenchman, um, came up with an ingenious solution to a very, very complicated problem. Paris, as, as you know, has an underground railway system. It also has a huge overground rail network. And it, it was the golden age of, of the railways. And there were more and more and more and more passengers. And more and more and more trains were needed. Now, I don't know if you've ever considered how much complexity is involved in scheduling a train timetable for an entire city. <laughs> and then an entire country... It's, uh, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's so crazy that, in fact, one of the most reliable ways to do it, and still to this day, one of the most reliable ways to do it, is to use uh, the, the sort of chart that Charles Ebry uh, invented. And he basically, uh, he found a way to plot on this chart uh, the locations of all the trains between Paris and Le Havre. And in doing so, he made sure that none of the trains crashed into any of the other trains. Well, that's pretty fantastic. It's really, really awesome. And uh, I, I'm sure it says something in, in the, the art, this, this wonderful article that I am so in love with. Um, there, there's been a kind of a modern day example, I forget where it was, where, you know, algorithms and computers and, and people with lots of experience and expertise in mani manipulating data, but in a similar situation, um, an Ebri chart was used to sort out the problem of the trains because it's just the best way to do it. Or it's certainly the best way that, that you know, we can kind of visualise it and understand it and fit it in our brains, which I think is, is very, very much the point of a graph. So it, we, we continue, we're still on 1847 and more and more and more instances and definitions for this word are, are they're still coming thick and fast. So in 1856, we have the first written citation of the sense of graphic, meaning providing or conveying full unexpurgated detail, expressly stated or represented, explicit, especially in the depiction of sex or violence. So another shade, I think, here, because if you describe something vividly, which, you know, we have that kind of orphan citation from Etam Online saying people were using that sense of the word since the 1570s. But certainly the idea of, um, you know, kind of producing by words the effect of a picture, that, that's been around since 1669, at least. Um, but, but this kind of particular sense of graphic detail, in other words, maybe a little bit more detail than we need. That is, than is kind of yeah. societally acceptable. But, you know, nonetheless, those details exist. So whether or not we should, we should hear them or see them is, yeah, that, that's a whole other argument. And then in 1865, we start to, to get more into the kind of realms that you might have expected from a word like graph. So in 1865, graphic is recorded as meaning of a geometrical proposition or a branch of geometry, concerned with position and form, not with measurement. So you can look at this as opposed to metric, you have graphic. So we're, we're right. talking about geometry here very much and, and the geometric sense of graphic meaning position and form. And then in 1866, hot on its heels, we have the term that gives us, uh, that gives us the word graph. Graphic formula um, which was abbreviated to give us graph. Now, this, this is a complicated one. I'm going to just take my time and read this properly. These definitions all come from the okay. OED, incidentally. So graphic, pertaining to the use of diagrams, linear figures, or symbolic curves. A graphic formula in chemistry, a formula in which lines are employed to indicate the connections of the elements represented by the symbols. So to begin with, Graphic formulas were specifically the, pre the 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 world of chemistry was using graphic formulas, and they were using it to indicate. I, I suppose that the things that are too small and too complicated to see. 
And this led us on then to the graphic method or graphic solution, which is a method of solving problems in, uh, in algebra, for example, by the construction of a diagram from which the result is obtained by direct measurement instead of calculation. And the graphic method, also the method of recording movements of a part of the body by some automatic instrument, e.g. the movement of the pulse by the sphygmograph. I only included sphygmograph in there because, yeah, ooh, is exactly right. Yeah. So in 1866, we start to get this sense <laughs> of position and form and diagrams actually having a practical use. I, I remember as, right. as a kid studying maths and, and, you know, drawing the graphs and graphs of a straight line. And it's taken me almost until now to really kind of properly understand what that stuff was all about. And there's been some, because Mr. Hamlin and I like nothing better than to sit around discussing the graph of a straight line. But, you know, I, I genuinely, <laughs> I, I very much recall at the time that I learned those things because I had to learn them for an exam rather than in any way understood them. Sorry, former maths teachers yeah. of mine, but, but that's how it was. But, but now I, I find that really brilliant. The fact that you can, you can tap away a calculator or you can just draw a picture and the picture will tell you what you need to know. That's, yeah. that's pretty magical. And, you know, in the same sort that of way cool. that, that writing is its own special magic, I feel like graphs are too. So in 1866, graphic formula was being used as a term uh, with this particular meaning. And in 1878, finally, my goodness, I'm not one for a preamble. I am definitely one for a preamble. But it's not until 1878 <laughs> and a whole lot of talking that we finally get to the word graph. Graph is defined as a wow. kind of symbolic diagram used in chemistry, mathematics, etc., in which a system of connections is expressed by spots or circles, some pairs of which are colligated by one or more lines. Also, occasionally, the system expressed by one of these diagrams. In abstract terms, a finite non-empty set of elements together with a set, empty or non-empty, of unordered pairs in these elements. Graphs were first employed under the name of graphic formulae, as we just discussed, in chemistry for expressing the relations of the elements forming a compound. The application to mathematics, apparently also the shortened name, is due to Sylvester. I got very excited about Sylvester being the person to coin this term just because of graphic uh, telluride, uh, sylvanite and Transylvania. It just struck me as nice that there was a little coincidence of another sylvan being yeah. uh, being involved. In... There's a pleasing symmetry. Yeah, there. absolutely. And then thick and fast, it seems as though once graphs existed, everybody wanted on. So in algebra in 1886, we have a graphical representation of the locus of a function, the traced curve of an equation, uh, a line or curve representing the variation of one quantity with another each quantity being measured along one of a pair of axes at right angles. And it wasn't until 1886 that, that graphs were defined as the things that we kind of understand them to be these days. And yet, right. graphics just keeps on giving. In 1888, we get a graphic abbreviation. This is a term used in linguistics and paleography. Ooh, exciting. Here's what neat. a graphic abbreviation is. It is a written abbreviation of a word intended to be read as a full word, as distinguished from one which is pronounced as it is spelled. So sometimes when you write an abbreviation, oh, okay. you want people to read lol. And sometimes when you write an abbreviation, you want people to read laughing out loud. That is a, a graphic right. abbreviation. So I, I'd never come across that term before. That was quite interesting. And then in 1889, graphics starts to kind of, it has a little bit of a, a resurgence in terms of its original meaning. Um, we get the technical use of diagrams and figures as an aid to mathematical calculation or to engineering or to architectural design. We're back into the realms of drawing. And um, they, they keep coming. Graphic is really just the, the word that keeps on giving. In 1937, we have the sense of graphic meaning sharp or well-defined, both literally and figuratively. Something that's clear or unequivocal is graphic. Right. Yeah. In 1953, we get graph theory, the mathematical theory of the properties and applications of graphs. In other words, all that stuff that these guys have been doing since the 1850s, someone finally decided it needed a name. In <laughs> 1960, we get graphics in the sense that, that I think when it's pluralized, we often, in a modern context, would use this, would, would mean this. Graphics as in design or decoration that involves typographic elements, the production of pictures, diagrams, etc., in association mm. with text. 
Hmm. And then in 61, graphics meaning an example of the graphic arts or of graphic design. Also a diagram, a pattern, a picture, any of these things produced by means of computer. Computer graphics. So right. yeah. the word continues, it, it, it keeps going. In 1964, we see the first written citation of the term graphic novel. And yep. in 1966, okay. uh, a, a more kind of fixed sense of the production of diagrams by means of a computer. In 1969, we get the graphic equaliser. And yeah. uh, in, I never, never did know how to use a graphic equaliser. I mean, it was fun <laughs> sliding all the sliders and doing all the things, but I, I was yeah. never really sure what was supposed to happen. And then lastly, in 1981, we get a graphic user interface. So again, in, in computing and in web yeah. design, um, a little picture we can click on. So I, I wasn't expecting graph to, to take me to so many places, so many corners. Yeah. Etymologically, which, which I haven't actually mentioned at all yet, it comes from oh, yeah. the Greek graph or graphe, G-R-A-P-H-E, uh, as it's rendered in, in English, which means drawing or writing. Right. And graphia, which means a description of something. I find that really interesting, that, that it should be the same word for drawing, writing and, and a description, because I don't know, I, I would think of a description as, as an, an oral thing, but of course a drawn description or yeah. a written description, uh, just my particular take on the word, I suppose. This then comes to Latin, graphicus, drawing or writing, and this is how it comes into English. Interestingly, there's a slice of pie to sit Indeed. alongside this word. Oh, I, I got really excited about this one. I, I just, yeah, <laughs> made me happy. So, Graphe in Greek, graphicus in Latin, and graphic and graph in English are all postulated to come from the pi root gerbh, G-E-R-B-H, with that little <laughs> asterisk that uh, yeah. reminds me why I can't pronounce this word. And this particular root means to scratch or to carve. Hmm. That's what writing like that. is, after all. Yeah, just scratching um, and carving. Scratching and carving. So... Interestingly, I, I observed as I, as I look at the Pi root, the Ger Germanic languages, they seem to have followed the K sound and the Greek maintained the G sound. So right. we got graphicus and graphe in, in Greek. But the, the, a lot of the other words that come from the scratching or carve, including the word carve, um, th they use the K sound. You know, we, we know that G and K often um, kind of diverge yeah. and substitute for each other. Um, and then I went off to the University of Texas at Austin with a wonderful, wonderful Pi Etymon website, which takes yeah. Julius Pocorny's wonderful work and makes it a little bit user-friendly for chumps such as me. <laughs> Pocorny defines this Pi route as to carve, to scratch or to write. And here are some of the English cognates. Okay. Uh, interestingly, if, if you're a speaker of, of, other, uh, of other languages, the Pocorny and the, the University of Texas at Austin's website gives you those cognates in, in other languages too. So if, if you're better educated than I am, then uh, it might be an interesting resource for you to check out. Uh, here, are, here are the English cognates that, that I found. I was very pleased with myself. This was part of my, my preciousness about not winging this word because usually when there's a pi route, um, quite often Etym Online is good enough to have an entry on that pi route and I use that. Uh, yeah. there, there wasn't a, an entry on Etym Online for, for this particular route. So I just, I, I did what a real researcher does and I, I went off and found out about it myself. And I was feeling so <laughs> very proud of myself for not having cheated for once that um, I decided I wanted you to have this list of cognates. So, yeah. hold on, here goes. Okay. First we have a grapha, which I assumed meant something along the lines of not being able to, to write. But in fact, this yeah. word means it's the sayings of Jesus in early non-canonical Christian writings. I'd never heard this word before or this meaning oh. before. Um, so I, I thought that was quite interesting. I wonder in the sense of not being written down, as in the yeah. things that Jesus said, but perhaps not which were not quote unquote officially recorded. Not that you can really call much of the Bible an official recording, but I thought that was quite interesting. Yeah. We then have the word that I thought that was, agraphia which uh, is defined as dysgraphia, which, you know, difficulty with or inability to write. Uh, often goes along with dyslexia, which is, n but, but they're not the same thing. Interestingly. Right. No. Yeah. We then get anagram, 
uh, with that GR graph gram um, thing. And, you know, are you a fan of anagrams, Ryan? I I do enjoy them. I'm not like, good are, at them. See, I, I really hate anagrams because I'm really bad at solving them. Hmm, I yeah. feel like they're I, f- I feel like it's something that I could work at for many hours and never get any better at. But maybe I'm wrong. Anyway, we then get from this uh, carving scratching sense of the word, we get the word carve, meaning to cut with care or precision. Right. And then we get the word really like this one, crab. Oh. Because they have crab. little crab. They have little carvy things. Cutters. Little carby yeah. cutters. <laughs> Little crabby cutters. I like that. Uh, the same one gives us crayfish, crawfish. How do you pronounce that word? I never know. I think it depends on where you are. Okay, that that's that's fine. Um, and, and again, I think the same thing. It defines it as a small freshwater crustacean resembling a lobster um, with also little, little crabby, uh, crabby places. Now, the, the little crabby cutters was what I thought of first. But in fact, if you look up the etymology of the word crab, it's not relating to the cutting so much as it is relating to the next cognate on the list, which is crawl. Now, okay. crabs creep. They move slowly with body close to the ground. But the word crab also... Um, this root is, is, is also... It's kind of interpreted as a crab is holding on with its fingernails. Something who crawls is holding on with its fingertips or its fingernails, almost okay. as though it's carving out little inscriptions as it drags as it itself goes. along. Yeah, yeah. Which I, 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 I really, I really enjoyed that that image um, of the yeah, like cutting that. crab, not with its pincers, but uh, with its crawling. We then get a diagram similar to graph, a line drawing drawing for mathematical or scientific purposes with that gram, and dysgraphia, as we, we saw above, an inability to write. Um, we then have epigrams, the little poem, and yep. epigraph, which it had never occurred to me before. I thought that an epigraph was related in sense of epigram to, you know, sort of little pithy saying, but an epigraph is literally an engraved inscription. Of course it oh, okay. is, because it yeah, comes from the pirate to carve. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> we, we then have the word, I like this one, glamour. Now, glamour seems to be etymologically more related to the gram and graph uh, sense of, of the root, because a glamour, with its original sense, was a spell, an illusion, and a piece of magic oh, that was written down. So th- this is, this is uh, how how that word comes to be on this list. We then have, I, I do love to pronounce this word in the singular just because it's so unbelievably pretentious, but graffito, as in to oh, nice. uh, carve or inscribe uh, words on a wall that aren't supposed to be there, uh, graffiti. Um, we have graft to cause um, one thing to unite with another thing. Grafting as in with plants or with uh, animal husbandry, I believe. Right, We've got yeah. the, the suffix gram, meaning drawing, writing, or record. And the gram, the metric unit of mass, they are, in fact, um, almost exactly uh, etymologically identical. Uh, drawing, writing, record, uh, record, excuse me, and the metric amount of mass. We've then got the word grammar, the study of a word or a sentence. And I, I didn't realise this comes from the, the Greek gramma, which means a single letter. So... Technically speaking, okay. grammar, although it's the study of words and sentences, it is in fact about individual letters, uh, etymologically at least. We then have graph and the suffix suffix grapher, as in photographer, or lexicographer, and it simply means one who writes. I quite like photographer, uh, the, someone who writes with light. Yeah. It's rather beautiful. That's a good one. Uh, graphic, which they define here as drawn, engraved, or written, and graphite, this the black soft carbon used in pencils. Um, we have graphy suffix again, writing a representation, and iconography, illustration by pictures or other visual representations. Then we've got one that, that really stands out for me. That's very cool. Yeah, I like this one a lot because it, it's so close to the original pirate, kerf. Kerf? You know what the word kerf means? I love this word. No K-E-R-F. Idea. A kerf is the slit or notch made by a saw. 
Oh, that's cool. That thing has a name. Or in the, the, to, to, to give it its full definition, a slit or notch made by a saw or a cutting torch. I don't know what a cutting torch is, but I'd quite like to play with one. Cutting torches are extremely fun to play with. Yeah, you you've you have done this thing. You have this experience. I've had, I have had the pleasure of using actually I mean, a couple different kinds of cutting torch, I, and they are all, I, without exception, extraordinarily fun. I don't know what they are, but I'm thinking lightsaber, basically. It, basically, yeah. yeah, basically a very small, loud lightsaber. Awesome. So cool. So yeah, they they leave a kerf in whatever you're cutting, and um, yeah, it's such a beautifully Germanic word, kerf. Uh, I, I like it because it sounds modern yeah, and, and isn't. That's awesome. I, maybe because I'm maybe I'm thinking of nerf. Yeah. And also korf ball. That's uh, yeah. I have oh, those maybe. two words kind of squidged into it. Um, okay, onward with the the, right. the cognates. The two, three. Interesting little words here. Two of them are next to each other in the alphabetical list and the other one's not. But um, I, I was quite curious about this. So first we have Landgrave, then we have Margrave, and lastly we have Paul's Grave. And this, uh, I hadn't ever heard of any of these words, but it did make me think of Kilgrave from Jessica Jones. Yes, um, yeah. Nothing whatsoever to do with the slightly morbid sounding uh, grave part. So, respectively, Landgrave means a German count having territorial jurisdiction. A Margrave is a military okay. governor of a German border province. And Paulsgrave is a count palatine, literally the count of a palace. And specifically, it was the count of the Rhine River. So um, there's there's oh, some niche geeky words for you, but uh, ultimately they they have their their roots in uh, that same pie root that gives us graph. We then have odograph instrument for recording course or distance travelled, and I, I like this one a lot too. Paleography, which is a study of scripts or mm -hmm. writing from former eras. Super geeky. I like it a lot. We also have paragraph, yeah. one or more sentences in a composition, and parallelogram, the gram part of parallelogram. Um, this one yeah. I, I liked because geeky words thrill me. A plethysmograph. A plethysmograph is an instrument measuring variation Whoa. in body part size based on blood volume. It sounds so brilliantly wow. steampunk Victorian. I'm imagining glass carboys and, and tubing and I, I don't really know how that's going to work but I feel like it takes yeah. up a whole room um, we then have yes. th this was a word I, I didn't know before and, and it's it's one that I should know because my god there's so much of this about plutography plutography mm. is media describing the lives of rich or famous people um, right. so quite a lot of the media in fact uh, is I think considered plutography then the word program, the the meaning given here is not the meaning I, that word does not mean what you think it means. Um, they define it here as a, a public notice, which makes perfect sense when you look at the etymology of the of the word. Pro means for, yeah. and gram means writing. It's writing for everyone. Yeah. And that's what I a like program it. is. And then huh. um, pseudoepigraphica, sorry, pseudoep Sud epigrapha, I've put in an extra syllable there, hmm. which is uh, apocrypha. In other words, written down lies. We have topography, right. the position and elevation on maps and charts. And um, again, I'm a little bit out of alphabetical order, but I really like this word. Prosopography. Ooh. So many syllables. Now, a prosopography is a statistical study describing people or characters in context. The reason I like this word so much is that it, it reminded me of another highly clever word that I recognised. And I do like feeling clever when I know clever words. I couldn't remember what the clever word meant, so I went and I looked it up. Uh, prosopopoeia is the, the, the clever word that I thought I recognised. Nice. A prosopopoeia is a, a rhetorical form. It's, it's sort of a personification but not really. There are there are two definitions given. So the first is personification, where you give uh, an inanimate object human qualities. 
In classical Latin, a prosopopoeia was speech composed and delivered in the character of another person, like an impersonation. In post-classical Latin, also a representation of an inanimate or abstract thing is speaking or is displaying other characteristics of an inanimate conscious being. So that's our, our, um, our personification. And it, it comes from, it's, it's just, it's one of these lovely Greek, I always think of them as sandwich words where there's just lots of little word elements sandwiched together until we get a big long word that means something more complicated. So yeah. Hellenistic Greek prosopopoeia comes from ancient Greek prosopon, which means face, and poia, which means to make. So a prosopopoeia makes a face in the same way that onomatopoeia makes a sound. So if like you want it. to... Um, if you want to represent another person's face, as in another person's character, you would use a, a prosopopoeia. All such Ooh. things as can be represented by the pirate that gives us the word graph. Graphic formula, uh, loosely invented by William Playfair after the wonderful uh, representation by Michael Florent van Langren, and a word that has so much history, I almost felt like plotting it on a graph myself. Nice. That is that was quite the journey. I like that. It's a lot of stuff. I was, now you I was see why I didn't just see. want to wing it. Yeah, <laughs> that would be tricky. Very cool. Yeah, Do I was like, I've literally graph. never had so much to say about a word before, and it's all gone. <laughs> <laughs> We can now all put yeah. your rage from last time in proper context. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad. You understand me now. <laughs> yeah, I totally get you now. Um, I could have drawn a graph of that rage, but I would have needed a big piece of paper. Yeah, <laughs> it, would have been, it would have had to have been huge. Um, very cool. I just have a, a fairly little word, but it was one that I found interesting and I was... Just one of these ones where it's like it's in, it started out differently enough, but it's got enough ambiguity to it to make it interesting. I think. And the oh, word nice. that I have chosen for today is flirt. Ooh. F L I R T, and I I saw this word in some other context. I was like, that is a a strange word. It, like, I don't get yeah. it. It doesn't make any sense. It, I can't immediately tell where or how it came to be, I, you know, like, no idea. Let's find out. It's like the opposite, the opposite of a Greek sandwich word. Yeah. It has no, no components to it whatsoever, immediately no visible. Um, so this word dates back to 1549. And the earliest definition given in the OED is... Oh, that's flirt. earlier than I would have thought for some reason. Yeah, it's also one of those where I couldn't tell if I was surprised by that or not. But <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. I mean, in terms of the the concept, that's been around forever. Um, but yeah, yeah. Cool. Okay. So the it means a smart stroke of wit, a joke, or a jest. And then it's possible that it also has inherently like a a jibe or a scoff kind of meaning to it. Oh, okay. um, so 1549 it shows up as a noun um, 1562 it we have references of a flirt being a woman of a giddy flighty character oh I or, love those words <laughs> right um, so best. in Johnson's dictionary a flirt is dis and this is I, I'm let not me guess sure Johnson find... didn't approve because Johnson hated fun well, his definition of a flirt was a pert young hussy. <laughs> My other favorite kind of women. <laughs> exactly. Um, 1577, it shows up meaning a smart tap or blow, um, as in oh. I'll give you a good flirt on the ear from something around 1691. Oh, I've never heard that sense before. That's cool. Uh, 1592, a sudden jerk or movement, quick throw or cast, a darting motion. And in 1600, a woman of loose character. So those are all the handful of sort of mid-1500s to the beginning of the 1600s definitions of the noun, uh, a flirt. 
it doesn't mean. Do you know what, one of, of those? One of those I've I've heard before in in a Scots context, when I was a little girl and learning Scots poetry was a thing that we had to do at school. Um, I had to learn a poem about a trout, the Aldbrun trout lay on a stain on a stain lay he, and I remember that whole poem. It was obviously drummed into me with force and probably fear, but. Um, there's a line that says, they're thinking I'm no worth the flirt of a fin or the blink of a bonny black e. Um, oh, and nice. it, it, it just it popped into my head there that, as you see, a quick darting movement, a flirt of a fin. But yeah, yeah. I didn't know I'd heard that sense before. Cool. But okay. still no sexy so, times uh, involved. No, it doesn't. So uh, the definition provided by the OED of, quote, someone who plays at courtship... Um, i.e. the modern meaning of being a flirt or being flirtatious, doesn't show up until the mid-1700s. Oh, and it's wow. interesting, just despite the fact that two of the very early definitions are specifically describing women, the first instance yeah. in 1732 is actually referring to a man. And then it's 1747, oh. we got the first instance of it being in writing, used to describe a woman who plays at courtship. Also, randomly, in 1786, we get a a watchmaking-specific meaning of a lever or other device for causing sudden movement of a mechanism. So, near as I can tell, you know how the second hand on an analog watch, like, ticks and makes that one sudden movement yeah. delineating each second? Well, the mechanism that starts and stops that sudden movement is called a flirt apparently oh that's super or at least cool i feel like the watchmaking the has its own lexicon that, that could be quite fascinating to investigate oh i'm sure now all of these things are the noun version of it because it the the earliest citations are for noun but when you look up in the etymology section of the noun the oed says that it comes from the verb to flirt which doesn't show up I mean, now this is one of these things where this is a perfect illustration of first written use is not first use because the yeah, first written sure. use of the verb is 1553, three years or four years after the first written noun use. But OED says the <laughs> yeah. etymology comes from the verb. So, you know, the earliest verb use is to turn up one's nose or like generally something to do with sneering, but like raising your head and there's a lot of nose-related stuff involved in the early flirts as a verb. <laughs> <laughs> In 1582, we get it to move with quick darting movements. So all of these things follow the pattern of being like five years later, five years after someone wrote down the noun sense, they also got around to writing down the verb sense. Um, because it's not till 1771. I love that. It's... They got around to it. It makes it sound as though it was a, a conscious act, like there was someone whose job it was to just write down all the words. Yeah. I'm like, oh, oh I'm crap, doing nouns just now. I'll get to the verbs. <laughs> yeah. So 1781 <laughs> is to play at courtship or to practice coquetry. Um, so it takes a couple hundred years to get there, but we do eventually get there. And since the late 18th century, it's meant what we know today what we don't know is why so mm. the oed just says as far as etymology of the word flirt goes it's uh onomatopoeic and like sort of imitative like flick flip flirt spurt and squirt like just that kind of yeah i, I was yeah i was wondering about that yeah okay that kind of idea um which makes sense, and and nobody has any like it's all it all ends in the origin unknown, you know, mysterious fog. Um, but that makes sense because it's just sort of just a word that is quick to say, and conveys that sense even if you don't know it. You can kind of see someone just yeah making that noise when they want to describe that motion, and so <laughs> yeah yeah you know. Yeah, it just it's a word that is a noise that we've ascribed a meaning to and we all agree on, which is like most words, I guess. <laughs> the, as far as um, etymology goes beyond that, and as far as specifically how it gets from a sudden jerk movement, a smart blow, you know, something like that, to 
the play around coily with someone you want to play around coily with meaning of it. It's not clear, but Atom Online has two different possibilities that it presents. And so the first is related to the 1600 uh, citation, which is to flit in constantly from object to object. Okay. So the idea of just bouncing back and forth, you're not committing to anything, you're just right. flirting. Right, oh, that's, that's nice, I like that, yeah. And so Almost that's like one, you can see that. <laughs> yeah. The other one is, in 1660 you get this idea of, it goes from a sudden jerk of movement to, uh, the this quotation here is, to flirt up a fan is the example. So if you if you picture one of the fold, those folding fans, you just kind of flick it up. Yeah. And Adam Online says, this was, quote, long considered part of the coquette's arsenal, end quote. <laughs> well, yeah, I seem to recall. I, I feel like there's a crazy ass Victorian book out there that explains the language of fans. Because because oh, this sure was a is. thing, you know. I mean, women didn't really get to talk, did they? They weren't allowed, um, so they no. communicated in wh whatever way they best could. And so that the whole there's there's definitely a I, I don't know enough about this to provide any specific examples, like so much of the the world. Um, but I <laughs> I feel sure that 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 arsenal was was codified in some way, that there was a yeah. kind of a universal language of fans. Um, which is which is just brilliant. Yeah, that's pretty bonkers. But this, yeah, so that was the, the other idea is that possibly it, this sense contributed to the transition of the sense of flirt, like the action of yeah. flicking up the fan to all the other things that you also do with fans to convey these meanings, you know? Yeah, I feel like fans like inherently encourage flicking movements. So they do. Was this like absolutely? Was was it a man writing this down? This is what I really want to know. Like, yes, flicking oh, a fan oh, yeah. means she's she's right up for it. Get over there and give her your best lines, or maybe yeah, she was that's hot. Basically... <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, cool. yeah, another. There was one more Adam Online possibility, which is from old Fl old French flitterie which is sort of a diminutive of fleur, as in flower. But it oh. flitteré means to talk sweet nonsense, which you can kind of also see how that might influence the sense. Yeah. But yeah. So we don't know how it got there, but it started out with uh, a quick darting motion or a smart jab or a sneer or a scoff to, hey, you, we should talk. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's uh, so, that, that's that's great. What a cool little word. I am very much amused by the fact that pert hussies and women of uh, what 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 was your first definition? Um, women of, of loose first, character. Yeah, they're they're the ones that that the men are interested in talking to. I mean, if you want to be strictly etymological. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which which seems just, to just me, scientifically just, speaking, of course. There's a certain sense in that, um, because you know the the women fl flicking their fans are not able to uh, to talk or move. They they probably have less to offer um, a young gentleman who's uh, out there working on his flirting game. But then who knows yeah. if the communication of fans is uh, all that's cracked up to be? It's pretty <laughs> wild, isn't it? The, the whole like I I don't know about you. I, I haven't been single forever, so the thought yeah, of no having to engage in flirting and dating and, and oh, just so terrifying. <laughs> like, that sounds horrible. I, am, I don't think I was ever particularly great at those things, but I'm damn sure I'm not now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, I, oh yeah, sounds horrible. The other thing anyway, is, you know, yeah. I, I, like, I like to talk to people, like generally speaking, that's a thing that I do. And and it, it, there was always that, oh, they're flirting with you. And you're like, no, 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 we're chatting. No, 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 he's flirting with you. Is he? Um, well, since you seem to know so much about this, am I flirting with him or am I just talking? How do you know? What's the difference? Now I know. If only I'd had a fan, it would have all been clear. That's right. That's right. 
Everything gets clear when we have fans. <laughs> Those Victorian women really had it sorted out. <laughs> they knew what was up. And that's it for another episode of Lexitecture. To get in touch with us about something you heard in this episode, you can email us at words at lexitecture.com. You can also follow along and talk to us at Lexitecture on Facebook and Twitter and at Lexitecture Podcast on Instagram. For back episodes and the occasional blog post, visit us at lexitecture.com. Thanks very much, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thank you.